Hello Brain Shakers, welcome to the Brain Shakers Academy, your host here, Brave Alistair. Now we have been looking at the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and we have looked at what they are, how we can classify them, how we diagnose them and the pathophysiology behind the scenes during a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. In this particular session, we are looking at the management of the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Now, what are some of those drugs that we can use in the management of these hypertensive disorders? So let's quickly dive into this today's session and look at some of the selection of the drugs that we can utilize. Now, the treatment or rather the management of these hypertensive disorders of a pregnancy is dependent on what the classification is. For instance, if you are managing a chronic hypertension or you're managing a pregnancy induced hypertension or gestational hypertension, the management somewhat differs a little bit as compared to when you are managing a severe preeclampsia or you're dealing with an a, eclampsia. So if you are managing anything to do with a chronic hypertension, so we're just going to say basically if you're managing chronic hypertension here or you are managing a pregnancy induced hypertension, your number one or your first line of drug could be uh, labetalo. Now labetalo is known to be an alpha and a beta blocker. Okay, so the selection of drugs also is dependent on the region where you are and what policies and protocols are at play and whatever country you're obviously watching me from. So it's dependent on what is readily available for you in the management of uh, these hypertensive disorders. But some of the commonest drugs that you can use or you can select to actually manage these hypertensive disorders is what I will be discussing with you today. So you have alpha and beta blockers. Commonest of them all is labetalo, very active and very potent uh, uh, blocker and so if you administer it orally uh, it is three times it is three times a better blocker than it is an alpha blocker and if it is administered intravenously this then raises to about 6.6.9 6 to about 7 in terms of how potent or how um active the active ingredients of labetalo will be so basically that is what labetalo is going to come in and do this is your first line medication in terms of the treatment of chronic hypertension and pregnancy induced hypertension it will come in bring in a, a reduction into the blood pressure and one of the commonest side effects here is that it is going to depress uh, the uh, no, heart rate, meaning that it is going to reduce the heart rate. That's the commonest side effect. Why? Because it is a beta blocker. And when it is a beta blocker, it works on the beta 1 adrenergic uh, receptors. And this then is what will then cause a reduction in the heart rate. Now, number two, or the second line of treatment in terms of uh, treatment or management of chronic hypertension or pregnancy induced hypertension, then you will be considering a calcium channel blocker. Okay, you can choose a calcium channel blocker and you can use drugs such as nifedipine here. So nifedipine is actually a dehydropyridine um, calcium channel blocker. So dehydropyridine is just DHP here. So what happens within the um, the contraction of the muscles there is that there has to be a movement of calcium into the cell for the actin and myosin to actually come together or the, for the contraction effect to actually happen. So what nifedipine will basically do is go and block this dehydropyridine so that it does not allow the movement of calcium into the cell and also does not allow the circulating calcium to then be passed through calcium gated uh, or calcium uh, voltage gated uh, channel. So meaning that there's not going to be adequate calcium that is then going to be in circulation for the contraction of the muscles. And that is why nifedipine at times is not only used for the management of chronic hypertension and uh, pregnancy induced hypertension because of this effect it can be used also as 
uh, tocolytic when it comes to preterm uh, labor because when you administer it, it will go and then cause an interference with the functionality of the dehydropyridine receptors. So that is your second line as far as a management of chronic and pregnancy-induced hypertension is a consent. And then your third line here, you can actually choose a centrally acting, so central acting blocker. So on this one, you can actually choose uh, Outdomet. Okay, so Outdomet is um, uh, the active ingredient there, I think, should be Methyldopa. Okay, should be methiodopa. This is a centrally acting blocker, which is obviously going to cause a reduction in the blood pressure and also reduce the peripheral vascular uh, resistance by then affecting uh, the functionality of um, the central nervous system. And then what is happening is that when you're using methiodopa, you can use methiodopa on its own or you can use methiodopa in combination to another drug which we call hydrochlorothiazide. Okay, so hydrochlorothiazide is basically a diuretic. Okay, it's basically a diuretic. And so uh, it allowing the ex exit of fluid then controls the blood pressure. In most cases, the active ingredient will be methiodopa. It comes in presentations of about 250 or 500 milligrams a presentation. So these are some of the drugs that you can actually select in your management of chronic hypertension and uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension. There are certain um, prescriptions or certain ways in which you can manage some of these presentations where you do not only use one drug but you may want to use two drugs say for instance using labiterol together with nifedipan but you must also be cautious when you're using other drugs that have the same effect or same way of action such as using for instance magnesium sulfate and nifedipine because they all have the effect on dehydropyridine receptors and they all have the potential to cause uh, calcium channel blocking. So you don't want to consistently cause that uh, state of uh, atony in uh, the system. So that is uh, the selection for you for chronic hypertension and pregnancy-induced hypertension. Now let's quickly look at how you will be managing your severe preeclampsia or your selection for in terms of medication for your chronic uh, your severe preeclampsia or eclampsia. So you can utilize labitalo again. So you are using an alpha. So you are using an alpha and a beta blocker. On beta blocker, again here, this is labitalo. Why? Because uh, when you use labitalo, it increases, and if you are giving it, that is intravenously. If you are giving it intravenously, it increases its potency by at least 6.9 or 7 or so, meaning that it is a very potent uh, alpha and beta blocker in terms of its uh, functionality. So you can use this. You can then give your... Um, your orals, then you go to the loading dose where you give a bolus and then you can give that bolus obviously up to about four boluses where you give the maximum of about 200 milligrams dose. And then if um, that is for uh, obviously, when you're giving the oral, you give about 200 milligrams, which can be repeated after 30 minutes. Then you go ahead and give an IV bolus of 50 milligrams, then which you can give times four, which we should reach only a maximum of about 200 milligrams. And then if you are giving a maintenance dose, if you're giving a maintenance dose for labitalo, then you will have to give at a rate of four meals per hour. Okay, then you maintain that uh, patient on that labitalo infusion. Now, that is for your first line. And if your first line hasn't worked, then you will be going to a peripheral vasodilator, which is going to be a hydralazine. So you have a peripheral here. Okay. Vasodilator, which is going to be hydralazine. So hydralazine also 
has the potential to actually cut down on how much calcium is going into the cell and that is how it manages to actually cause that dilatation of the vessels so that then blood flows without um, much resistance so you would be giving hydralazine so with hydralazine you want to be cautious before you give the hydralazine are you giving it to somebody who is pregnant or are you giving it to somebody who has delivered if you want to give it to somebody who has um, delivered you may not need to give them fluids before you administer the hydralazine but if you're giving it to someone who is pregnant you may need to give them some fluids to prevent a hypoperfusion or placental hypoperfusion because what it will do is it will just dilate the peripheries and then drop the blood pressure and then you end up with placental hypoperfusion that's the least that you want to achieve as you try to control the blood pressure you also want to make sure that the fetus is in good shape and is in a good environment so give a an amount of fluids it could be about 500 ml or so of fluid and then go ahead and administer the hydralazine so you can administer a bolus dose of um, hydralazine and once you have given so you can give IV bolus here so you can give an IV bolus of um, uh, hydralazine and when you have given an IV bolus of hydralazine then you can also give an IV infusion which is basically uh, more or less like a maintenance dose here okay and the maintenance dose will obviously be running at five uh, mils uh, per hour and then you continue monitoring the blood pressure to see if the blood pressure is then being controlled okay so those are the two that you would go as in first line and a second line but obviously if you are going into a state where you are dealing with severe preeclampsia it means that you would then consider the need for you to administer magnesium sulfate now if you look at the intracellular fluids there if you go back to the basics and go back to the first videos that i have done on introduction to anatomy where i look at uh, the fluid intracellular fluids you have the second most plentiful element or cation in the system is magnesium so you have magnesium there that's the second most plentiful element as uh, as a cation okay so magnesium is an important element why because it is going to be there bringing in neurochemical transmission Okay, and from neurochemical transmission, and then it will also support enzyme function. Okay, it also supports the enzyme function, and then it will bring about sensitivity. Okay. So the sensitivity of the neural system is also going to be facilitated by the presence of the magnesium. So this is the second most plentiful intracellular uh, cation that we are going to uh, have. Now, if you are going into a, a situation so this is muscular sensitivity here and if you are going into a state where you are preventing uh, a woman from going into eclampsia or preventing the existence of convulsions or treating convulsions then you will be thinking of giving magnesium sulfate for these purposes and because it has also properties that are um, um, work for the uh, facilitation or the preservation of neurology then it is used also in preterm labors just to try and help preserve the neuro uh, function for the fetus so when you are giving magnesium sulfate you'll be giving magnesium sulfate here and magnesium sulfate is going to be used for the prevention of those uh, convulsions and sometimes even when a woman has convulsed then you will go ahead and give them magnesium sulfate so you give magnesium sulfate a loading dose and then you will also give a maintenance dose so the administration of magnesium sulfate differs from place to place so you look at what is workable for you and i look at magnesium sulfate in more detail and how you reduce the concentration to bring it down to a 20 percent concentration and how it can then be administered and i look at magnesium sulfate in a separate video but basically you will be giving a loading dose and you will be giving a maintenance dose as well so these are some of the drugs that you can utilize in the management of um hypertensive disorders but also quick to mention is the importance of one other drug which uh, we refer to as aspirin or ASA so 
aspirin or asa is just an acetylsalicylic uh, <coughs> uh, acid. So this is just acetylsalicylic acid. Okay, so acetylsalicylic acid is a non-selective uh, uh, cyclooxygenase inhibitor. So when you give a lower dose, okay, so pregnant women will tend to receive from about the 12th week of gestation up to about uh, 10, they tend to receive at least about 150 milligrams. Why? Because this drug or ASA has the capacity of then inhibiting the cyclooxygenase pathway and when it is inhibiting the cyclooxygenase pathway there are two pathways there's a cyclooxygenase pathway one and the cyclooxygenase pathway two now when we looked at the pathophysiology we also looked at uh, what causes a platelet aggregation or consumption of pl uh, platelets and we did make mention that we have thromboxane an element called thromboxane and it's usually thromboxane A2 that is produced now this thromboxane A2 that is produced is usually produced through the cyclooxygenase pathway 1 so because aspirin has a non-selective action on the cyclooxygenase pathway meaning it can block two and it can block one when given at lower dose it would then block the activation of this thromboxane so that the platelets then are not consumed together so basically those are some of the drugs that we use in the management of these hypertensive disorders and if you found this particular video helpful in understanding how we would manage uh, these hypertensive disorders then do give it a thumbs up share the video as much as possible and if you have not followed me on Facebook as the Brain Shakers Academy or you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please head on to the YouTube channel, subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss any of this amazing stuff that we'll be looking at. I look at uh, magnesium sulfate in another video, so do check out for it. I'll see you in the next one.